Welcome to another conversation. I'm Bill Haney. Today we're going to talk with the person who is responsible for the preservation and the administration of one of Oakland County's hidden gems. Lorraine Campbell is executive director of Troy Historic Village. It's a unique treasure which is enjoyed and visited by thousands of people every year and in a year round. And yet so many folks who would find it fascinating are unaware of just how delightful a time awaits just minutes away at the northwest corner of Waddles and Livernoy Road in Troy Township. Lorraine Campbell is my guest, but I call her Rainy, uh, because she's been guiding Troy Historic Village for 18 years, and I've known her throughout that time. She oversees the daily operation and administration of 11 historic structures and a truly impressive collection of over a thousand items on local and regional history. And I've known her for too long to call her by her given name. So for me, she's Rainy Campbell, and she's granted me a dispensation to be more informal than she really deserves in her official capacity as the executive director at Troy Historic Village. Rainy, what kind of a staff and organization have you got to handle all of this resource you're responsible for, and how many visitors do you really have in a year? Well, we have a creative staff, and it's not huge. Um, we have three full-time employees, uh, I'm one of them, and then if you add up all the part-timers, it's the equivalent of about seven and a half, 7.7 full-time equivalents. Uh -huh. On top of that, we have well over 100, sometimes it's clocked 180 volunteers, and collectively they contribute about 8,000 hours a year. So if you divide that out, that's another full four time, uh, full four full time people. Yeah. I'll get it straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that base of support, we see about 13,000 students, chaperones, and teachers each year, plus an additional 15 to 20,000 general public visitors. Wow. Pretty impressive numbers, and. Uh, it takes quite a, a group of people, uh, whether volunteers or full time, to operate a place like that. I know that you brought a good deal of experience and education to that role. I, I know you worked as a naturalist and you had a leadership role in the uh, Michigan Audubon Society. Is that true? That is true. And yeah. I like to say still that I feel some days like I'm a naturalist wearing historian's clothing. Mm. Uh, I am much more comfortable in hiking boots out in the field with binoculars sometimes than at formal meetings. I, I started out with a Bachelor of Science in biology. I worked uh, for both the city of Troy and first the city of Lansing as an interpretive naturalist teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I love teaching in non-traditional spaces. Uh, I worked for the city for about a dozen years in a nature center setting and then transitioned to teaching both in our historic village and in the nature center for two years. And then I was asked if I would be interested in taking over administration of the village in 2000. I went back to school and got a master's in history, also some certification in archive management, and I've been at the village full time ever since. Wow. And really, the years I spent with Michigan Audubon, and I'm glad you mentioned that, um, I was on their board of directors for 11 years, working in a variety of capacities, and I feel like working with a nonprofit organization gave me an additional degree in nonprofit management and understanding the role and the challenges faced with working with any nonprofit organization. Well, with the variety of responsibilities you have, it's probably a good thing that you've had mm -hmm. a great deal of experience in several different domains. I know you also are a writer and a good one, and uh, you, in addition to writing uh, proposals for grants, I'm sure, is a big part of your job, and uh, other documents. Uh, you wrote a delightful book, a uh, really charming book. In fact, it was uh, introduced uh, out here recently at, uh, at uh, the Gateway. Uh, with, we had an author's gathering, and yes. 
you kindly agreed to come out from Troy for that. And the book was called A Pocket Full of Passage, mm -hmm. and it was a memoir, uh, well, you can talk about it better than I can, but it was published by the University, uh, Wayne State University Press. And it was about the uh, childhood of a young <coughs> girl who lived for a time in a White House. Or not, not a White House, a lighthouse. A lighthouse. lighthouse. You know, and, and this is where my two passions come together. I was leading a natural history tour years ago to Isle Royal National Park, a true gem in the state of Michigan. And one of our side trips was to Passage Island Lighthouse, kind of off the northeast tip of the island. And I heard about this um, woman who, as a child, uh, would spend her summers on the island because her father was one of the assistant lighthouse keepers. And I actually met her as an adult and collected her stories. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until after I got the degree in history and learned how to work with archives that I felt comfortable going back, revisiting those stories, doing additional research, <clears throat> and then creating this historic fiction that chronicled her stories mm -hmm. as a child. And it was a really wonderful project to work on. And I'm delighted that adults as well as children still enjoy reading the book. Well, my whole family has, and I have very much. It's a delightful book. I should say that in the interest of full disclosure, that uh, my history with the offices that you occupy and with the village area itself uh, predates you by a few decades. Uh, the building that used to be uh, the Troy Township offices uh, is now your office. That's correct. And that's where I and uh, many other young boys and girls from what was then Big Beaver, Log Cabin, Poppleton, the many different schools in the area. Uh, when we turned 16, that's where we would go to get our driver's license. And uh, I imagine that's a story you've heard from, from others. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, we still have visitors drop by who say, um, I used to work in this building. I came here for my driver's license. This is where my father came to meetings. So it, we still get those uh, township stories and history, and people are fascinated because my office building has both a vault and a jail cell mm. in the basement. So it's really a cool building. Yes, indeed. I'm, I never experienced either of those <laughs> in my youth, although there are times when uh, that was a possibility. But enough for my ancient history. Uh, it does tie in, though, to the mission of the historic village in a way, because what you've done there is to capture uh, in a very evocative way the feeling. <clears throat> uh, when you walk into that space, it's like uh, the Twilight Zone going back That's right. 100 years in some cases. It's remarkable because so many people say when they enter the village, it's like they've stepped into a different time. Mm. They can't hear the traffic on Waddles Road or Livernoy, mm -hmm. they feel like they're in a special sanctuary. And that's a value that you can't put money on. And it's really a result of a lot of effort by the historical society that spans 50 years. Our organization is 52 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was um, organized in 1966 when Troy was transitioning from that township you remember to the big city of Troy we know today. And members who were residents in the township, like your family, mm -hmm. said, we don't want to lose our history. It's too important to us. And they saw the individual structures, homes, schools, the Methodist church, a couple of shops, as um, physical evidence, artifacts, if you will, of their history. And so over the course of four decades, they worked to acquire these buildings when they were going to be torn mm -hmm. down and get them as gifts or purchase them and then raise the money to move them to the area behind the old township hall. We have a five acre campus. and help restore them with financial support from the city of Troy. The resulting village then is sort of a time capsule of that 
American pioneer experience in early township era. And the city ran it uh, until 2011, when during the recent recession, they said, you know, we're just gonna shutter it. We're gonna close it. And the historical society said, no, we have not invested 50 mm -hmm. years to have that happen. And so we now operate under a long-term agreement with the city to administer the village, and we're responsible for all the staff and programs. We still get some financial support from the city, but truly the, the majority of our operation is funded by our programs, our donors, our sponsors, typical of any other nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So that's how the village got established. Well, I'm glad they made the decision not to shutter it. It was, I remember at that time when it was being considered, I, it was hard to believe that uh, a resource like that, a treasure uh, like that, uh, uh, would go away and not be available to people in the future. And we've seen in uh, some of the images that uh, we've seen so far and will throughout this program, that uh, the village has uh, a remarkable number, a very ambitious menu of activities. And uh, it, that makes me wonder if this is a, an outgrowth uh, or a realization of the mission statement that you have, mm -hmm. that you're, you're working against. Uh, which perhaps has changed a bit, but it seems to me that fundamentally it's about the same uh, uh, goals that you had in mind a number of years ago. One of the things that we've done, um, especially since 2011, is realize that we're not a traditional small house or history museum. We're not focused on exhibits with labels. So our mission is to, uh, to stimulate discovery and to cultivate lifelong learning through creative and meaningful presentations, programs, and experiences that engage the community. So there are some action words there that are really, really important. You know, this whole idea of creative programming, of active engagement, of integrating, let's make something, let's mm -hmm. do something, let's share something together. That's really heart and soul of our mission. And then we realize that while we are the Troy Historic Village, our history really is an example of regional history and Midwestern American history of small farming communities evolving into great cities. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the story that we need to tell. But always do it through engaged programming. I know I've seen uh, some of the demonstrations and the involvements. It's not just as though uh, an expert in weaving or in blacksmithing uh, shows how it's done, but rather the young people and mm -hmm. older ones too uh, uh, get involved in the process. And you see a lot of smiles, I've noticed, that yeah. people, uh, when they actually get to make something the way it was done uh, almost a century ago. Well, and that's why we, we have lots of education programs for youth, and every one of them is a balance of the curriculum that the state of Michigan mandates for social studies. It integrates other uh, disciplines, including science and economics and math, um, a little biology here and there, when we talk about making candles out of beeswax. So we learn the history, we learn the content, and then we make things and do things, mm -hmm. and that sort of cements the learning, doesn't it? Because we remember what we do with our hands. So when children come to the village, they will make candles, they'll make butter, mm -hmm. they'll pound metal, they'll make a toy, they'll manufacture something, and that's really what helps them remember mm -hmm. the history that they're learning. In the same way, we try and cross that over when we're doing adult programming. One of our uh, wonderful adult programs is blacksmithing and artisan arts. We are one of the rare places in South Michigan where you can learn to blacksmith on a coal-fired forge mm -hmm. using bellows that date to the 1700s. I remember it and I remember the aroma. <clears throat> That's another thing about it that uh, people uh, are surprised, uh, at least the groups that I've yes. taken out there. Uh, that the the smells, the yeah. aroma in the country store and in Poppleton School and in the church. Yes. Uh, uh, it's uh, amazing. And I think that helps take you back to uh, another time. And 
I don't recall ever being there when I haven't seen a group of students or elder people uh, doing all these activities that you're talking about. It's a very busy kind of a place. In fact, we've gotten so busy. Uh, in the last year, there have been more than one occasion where someone will come in for a meeting and we realize uh, we don't have a space to meet because every available meeting space is taken and mm -hmm. we'll end up sitting in the lunchroom over the table with a cup of coffee. And somehow I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think it's still that grassroots kind of face-to-face -face interaction that is so important for people today. And that's the other piece, Bill, with adult programming in an era where everybody's walking around like this, mm. you know, texting, Something, and, yes. and they feel like they're connected with the world because they're on Facebook or they're tweeting. That's all well and good, but we are still social beings. And having this kind of face-to-face -face interaction of meeting another person, of facing them and sharing mm -hmm. in this personal way what we're interested in, what we've learned, what we want to learn, the new skills, and doing that together is really an important role for the village and other cultural institutions. Well, we've talked about uh, a number of the programs that you do and the <clears throat> with the youth uh, and um, the Civil War days, I know. I was out there one time and it really was fascinating to watch. In fact, you had a fiddler, as I recall. Yes, we do. Who, who, uh, and, that, and we talked about the aromas, we talked about the sights, but also the sounds. The sounds of history. Yeah. Right. When we do Civil War days, and that's one of our, our stellar programs, I think we get a gold star for it every year. We, um, in the last, in May, we had 1,700 eighth graders come over the course of two weeks for a full day of immersion into the Civil War. And eighth graders study the Civil War during the second semester. So our, uh, we might get uh, 200 kids coming one day, but they're broken down into small groups which travel through six activities, including dancing, mm. with a, a company commander. They also learn how to drill. They get a wooden rifle. They learn left from right, how to charge, mm. how to follow orders. They learn about camp life. President Lincoln teaches them his technology of the day, which was telegraphy, so they're learning mm -hmm. a little Morse code. They meet Sojourner Truth in our church, and they hear her story. They sing with her. Oh. It's compelling. And they meet a Civil War medic who actually lays a kid on a door with two sawhorses and walks the kids through medical procedures, oh including God. an amputation. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and it, it really immerses the kids. And to have eighth graders who really can't be bothered with a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, go home and are so excited about mm -hmm. what they've learned mm -hmm. and what they've experienced, it's, it's a red letter yeah, day for us. You know, uh, when I was a student at the University of Michigan, uh, kids would talk about and joke about getting scolding looks when they would walk into a museum and ask the curator, what's new? Uh, <laughs> they get a kick out of that, pretty yeah. corny stuff. But I'm going to ask you, Rainey, is there anything, in addition to all the history we've talked about, is there anything new at the Troy Historic Village? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it's fun to say that the newest thing at the village was built in 1837. Uh, in 2010, right when the economy was at its worst, the Historical Society completed their mission to move the 1837 Niles Barnard home onto our campus. And uh, the building was weatherized and promptly shuttered, and it remained closed for the next seven years. Uh, as the economy is recovered nicely, the city of Troy has now appropriated the funds to restore the building. And just this week, I saw the architect's uh, schematic designs and drawings, and it, it's very exciting. Oh, so by this time next year, that building will be open to the public and available not only for programming that we would do, but we hope to provide that building to organizations who are looking for meeting spaces, to businesses, and to private parties who wish to use the site for receptions and parties and, mm -hmm. and workshops, etc. cetera. So it, uh, it will be a gathering place for the community, and we're really, really excited wow. about that. Wow. Well, even though you have the 
the word Troy in, in the title of your village, uh, it's clear that it's not just about Troy, uh, and that is not solely for the citizens of Troy, uh, and that many of your visitors uh, come from a good number of miles around. Uh, it's just a short hop, really, here uh, from uh, the Clarkston area, right. Independence Township, over to, to Troy. Um, and uh, so it seems that you then touch on a, a lot of themes uh, that are regional mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, and bring that material available to uh, people throughout the area. Well, our teas are an example of that. We hold monthly teas, which are basically an opportunity for adults to socialize over over refreshments and then enjoy a presentation and a, generally a very animated question and answer follow up. We have had presenters who are authors, photographers, historians, archaeologists. Uh, Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. people. One of the ones that you'll enjoy is a baseball fan, a woman who was a player um, on the women's baseball team back during the Second World War. Oh my and she was marvelous. And honestly, the question and the answer went well over 40 minutes at the conclusion of wow. the program. People just couldn't get enough of her. So we do try and tell larger stories uh, and also themes that are important in our country today. Uh, through the Oakland County Bar Foundation, we have a grant to do monthly constitution cafes. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity for adults and teens to get together with a facilitator and using the Socratic method of inquiry, have civil, civic discussions about our fundamental government document. So they'll take a, a section or a phrase of the constitution and say, is this still valid? Does it still work? But uh -huh. it's civil discussion. There's yeah. no rancor. No matter what your political background or preference is, we agree to explore, learn, and share. And I think that's really that's notable. invaluable. Yeah. That's a very refreshing change from uh, what we see often too much today. Well, this has been a fascinating trip down the memory lane for me. I can tell you that. <clears throat> uh, and. I'm really delighted you were able to come and share with us some of these stories and this marvelous resource that you have really done a terrific job. You and, and those, your colleagues that have helped, uh, have created something that is truly uh, invaluable. So thanks for being with us today and we'll get over to Troy Historic Village and uh, it's something that I never get tired of myself and never will. Um, and tell us though, uh, it, how available is it really right. to, to people? We are open Monday through Friday, 10 to 3, every day. Uh, we are also, during the summer, June, July, and August, open on Saturdays from 10 to 2. And people should check our website, troyhistoricvillage.org, because there are many instances where we have evening programs, we have day trips to various places in the community, houses of worship. The Constitution Cafe next year wants to go to the Jim Crow Museum up at Ferris State University. Mm. So always check into our website, check us out on Facebook and other social media platforms. We're on Twitter and we're on Instagram to figure out what's happening at the village today. We also do outreach programs. We take our programs to schools through History to You and to adult um, residential communities to um, provide history for those who can't come to us. Excellent, oh, that's marvelous. Well, I hope that a lot of our listeners and watchers uh, will avail themselves of it. Uh, the, the prices are, are ridiculously low, it yes. seemed to me, for the experience that you get. And uh, I know that uh, they will find much of interest of what was happening in the Oakland County area and throughout the state, really. Um, I guess a century and more ago, uh, but then also some of the more recent uh, materials that you've got yes. and some of the programs that you've got coming up uh, continue to add new vigor to uh, Troy Historic Village. Rene Campbell, thanks so much for being with us today. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you.